I was just I was looking at your uh, IMDb account and all the wonderful things you've worked on. How did you become a camera person? I mean, you started as an assistant, but how did you get into the business? I was working as a laborer at Warner Brothers. I, I wasn't big on school or anything, so I went from, you know, high school to uh, go, going to work really. And uh, so I had a a a, a, a man I co- I considered my adopted uncle. Um, and uh, so I, I approached him about it. Hey, can you get me a job in the studios? And he got me on the labor gang at Warner Brothers in 1961. I'm really dating myself. And uh, so I, you know, I worked as a laborer for years. And then I, uh, I met Sharon in 1964. And then we became engaged like a year later. And I thought, well, I don't want to do this I don't want to be a laborer all my life. I could, uh, and I, I knew that Henry, his name was Henry Lehman. I said, I, he was in the camera, but I said, what do I have to do to become a cameraman? And uh, he says, become a cameraman. Uh, he said, it's very hard. It's, it, there's no, now it's all fathers and sons to get into the union. And uh, I said, well, that's what I think. I, I didn't know anything about photography, nothing. And uh, I said, I really, what can I do to prove this is what I want to do? And he said, well, I can't promise you. He was in the camera department at Warner Brothers. It was a loading room. It was called the loading room. He said, I can't promise you, but you get off work on the labor gang at 3.30 every day. If you come in here uh, and show that you're really interested in this and, and learn how to load film, and uh, learn all the ropes in the, in the loading room, you know, the, all the equipment and that. Uh, I'll see what I can do. But he says, there's no promises. Don't you want to become a makeup artist? I said, look at me. Do I look like a makeup artist? <laughs> but, uh, or a grip or, or what? I said, no, no, I think I want to learn this. I, you know what, Paul? I don't know where that came from. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, I heard, maybe I heard they made good money. That could be it, you know. And because uh, I had no background in photography, I was interested in more other things, believe me, and uh, not always on the spiritual basis either. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, I met Sharon, <clears throat> and and so I did that. I did that. I, I would get off at three thirty every day on the labor gang, sweeping floors and pick, you know, labor work. And uh, I would go into the camera department, and I would spend hours. I, I learned the ropes and I was getting married in July, 1965. Three weeks before I got married, the business got, it got very busy and Warner Brothers needed a loader. And so they called the union to get availability lists for loaders. And they said, we have nobody available. And uh, they said, well, we've had a guy come in Michael O'Shea is his name. Uh, he's been coming in into our department for a year. Every night, he knows how to load. He knows, the, uh, you know, he's working to learn all the equipment and all of the stuff he needs to learn. They said, hire him. We have nobody on our union books. I mean, what a gift that was. I mean, I was getting, I, I, you know, like I said, I didn't know anything. I mean, I knew that. I spent the time. I would spend two or three hours a night in there and <clears throat> and it was just it was a blessing it just came up uh, uh, they didn't have anybody in the union I wasn't a relative uh, they said well if you know if, if you're confident in him hire him so they hired me and then I, I stayed in that loading room for two years working as a loader and uh, in those days you had to be uh, in the union you had to be a permit you worked on a permit before you, they had a grouping system. And, uh, but you got um, initiated after two years into the union. And when I went to get initiated, I went with a, a couple other guys and they were sons. And I went in and the uh, business rep, I remember after the interview, he said, well, congratulations, you are a member of Local 659 at the time. And uh, he said, but you're gonna have it hard. I said, well, why? He says, because you're not a relative. Wow. I said, okay. And I, and I, so I just worked hard. You know, I just, 
I, I started out as a, a film loader in that department, and I was a second assistant for a couple of years, I think. And then uh, I got a break to move up as a first assistant on a, on a, uh, on a show called To Roam With Love. And I just worked hard, you know, I, I, I uh, and I worked with good people. I mean, people that, that were teachers and, and uh, you know, tried to help me. So that nepotism, that nepotism thing never came up again. Okay. Never, it was just, I had a career. I was getting married. Now I got a career. Yeah. I mean, to me, that's, that's a gift, you know, and, uh, and then even those, the guy that's the, the business rep that said that to me, I think it just kind of instilled in me, well, maybe you can prove them wrong. The loading job. A lot of people wouldn't know what that even is today. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, because of the digital. But in those days, it was all film. So the film magazines, you had to load the, the, the film into the magazines. That was the primary job. You know, you'd load the thousand foot loads or 400s or whatever, and they had the different size magazines to fit on the cameras. And uh, so you learned, learned how to do that. And it wasn't that difficult. Uh, you go in the dark room and do that. And uh, I was working alongside another guy who just got in before me. His father was a director of photography and we became lifelong friends. But then you learn, you, you, you had to load carts, the, the camera equipment every night. To, they would come in from the different show. They would bring them into the, the, the loading department and you would restock them, you know. Uh, you would load the magazines. There was, I think, they would take twelve mag, twelve thousand foot magazines a day. So when when the exposed film came in, you unloaded it, reloaded it, taped it up, marked all the paperwork, sent it to the lab to be developed, and then reloaded each cart. And it's a huge responsibility, though. I mean, if you didn't do that right. There's a lot of work going on somewhere else and it's not going to exist because you haven't loaded properly. So it's daunting when you start it out, I'd say. Right. You have to, yeah, you have to pay attention. I mean, you're in the dark. You, you got to learn how to do it in the dark. And like I said, you know, the Henry Lehman, who helped me get in the union and, and the, the department, he was an assistant department head and there was a department and the guy that was moving out of the loading room at the time to open up this this position for me was going out as an assistant. He was a great teacher. His name was Richard Menardis. He was an assistant, a top assistant cameraman. So, I mean, he was very patient and, you know, I just paid attention, but you, your responsibility was a lot. Thank you for reminding me of that. Uh, because you, you were responsible for that exposed film to be transferred to the lab every day. You know, and if you expose that film, if you got in a hurry or something and, uh, you know, you turn the light on and the cover wasn't on the magazine, you, you've you ruined that role. Yeah. So, you you know, you had to be cautious and you had to be thinking all the time. And it was, you know, they, they, they used to use the N9, uh, the 85s and, and they were all mostly gels in those days. You'd have to cut the gels and these little... Uh, holders that slid into the camera. That was probably the hardest thing for me to do to get right, you know. But but like I said, the teachers, the people that were in the department, they were very patient, you know, and and it it was a good experience. I'm glad I'm glad I started that way. I'm I, because it's like it's not I don't want to say it wrong, but I started at the bottom. In those days, that's kind of how you did it, you know. Uh, I mean, some guys could become second assistants first and that, but I got the I got that groundwork in in that loading room for two years, and then oh, then another thing that I used to do was if I had a, like a, a ten o'clock call in the loading room after I learned what to do in there. Uh, I would go out on, I would kind of make friends with the assistant cameramen that were working on the different shows. I would ask if I could come in and observe them, okay. see what their, what their job was. 
and you know it was mainly the second assistant was just marking feet in that so they would teach me what to pay attention to uh and then they would ask me to come back and there were several of them, old timers at the time they say come on back you seem very interested you know and uh that's how I, you know, when I went out on production out of the loading room, I had had that experience of just applying myself, I guess. Uh, I never gave myself that much credit before, but uh, to learn, to learn every step. So I would go in and I would go in a couple of hours before my call would be in the loading room and I would work with the assistant cameramen that were working on the different shows. And and so when I went, when I, by the time I got to go out on production, uh, I had a little idea what their responsibility was. Was it all television shows you were working on at the time, or was it a mix? It was a mix. It was television and feature films at Warner Brothers. So you would load for both. You know, you would learn for both. And. Uh, uh, I mean, it was the same, they were the same carts, the same amount of magazines. The equipment might have been a little different on feature films. They had, you know, they had more specialty equipment sometimes. And, uh, you know, or you'd have a DP like, uh, I remember being in the uh, loading room and Haskell Wexler, I, I hadn't, I then obviously they hadn't probably, I'd probably heard of him, but he came in and used to, he liked to use the eclair. And that was a different way of loading a magazine. And I, I had to go to school all over again, you know. But you learn it, you know, you learn it. Uh, what was his reason for liking the eclair? Was it just a, a matter of taste or? It was a matter of taste, I guess, yeah. yeah. And you know, he did a lot, he, he, uh, he did a lot of big documentaries too before he, uh, I think before he became a big um, feature director of photography. And, uh, and that was just his preference. But, but the time I'd been in the loading room, we'd never loaded an Eclair magazine. It was all BSCs or, you know, Panavision, and they were all the same magazines. And, uh, uh, but when that came in, it was, it was a challenge for a couple, couple of days probably, but we got it right. Like I said, we were, I worked in tandem with another guy and uh, we figured it out. I'd say it was a hectic uh, schedule you had, long hours. 12 hour days in those days. So if I came in at 10 uh, and their call was seven o'clock or something, and if they had a later call, if, if there was shows that were coming in at, in the afternoon or something, they would adjust our time in the loading room. Well, you're gonna come in at three tomorrow afternoon because we got late shows. So, but the hours were uh, eight or nine, 10 hours at the most, I think. And Warner Brothers production was at a height at this stage, wasn't it? Because it was getting into television in a very strong way, as well as maintaining good cinema distribution. Because there were funny times for cinema as well, weren't they, in the early 60s? In the early 60s, there were, yeah. There was, uh, yeah, tel television, especially my experience at Warner Brothers, there was more television. There was more television, yeah. They were doing, uh, well, you, you probably do know, but Sunset, uh, 77, Sunset Strip, uh, Ho Hawaiian Eye, they were doing all those things in the 60s. And, and there was uh, F Troop, I remember. Uh, one show that you worked on, you started, I think your, one of your first production shoots, uh, early ones as an assistant cameraman was Daktari. I think it was inspired by the Howard Hawks movie, wasn't it, with John Wayne? Atari. That was that was the show that I moved out of the loading room to do. It was and it was just a it was a break, you know. It was my and the, the business was TV was getting very busy, and they needed a second assistant. And I because I I spent that time hanging out with assistants on sets when I went out, you know. I mean there was a lot I had to learn, you know. But uh, it it was a good break. It was a fun deal, you know. And I had a new baby and. Uh, I th my, our daughter was born by then, and uh, it just seemed to work out. Yeah, I, but I had a lot of fun, and the director of photography was a, a gentleman by the name of uh, Fritz Mandel, little little German guy, and uh, it was just a beautiful man. Somehow, I think I had, uh, you know, um, a knack that I get along with people. 
you know, my mom, my mom and dad taught me that, you know, always respect people. It's a great bonus to getting through life, I think. Yeah. And I think, and I was real eager. I was, you know, I thought I, I might, when I got comfortable being an assistant and then moving up, I thought, well, this is good. I, this is all I, I need be an assistant. I make a decent living. You'll never get rich, but this is okay. Because I, I had an insecurity about me that every step was too hard for me. Along the way, I found people that said, no, you have to move up. You, it's time for you to be a camera operator. Well, once I got to be a first, it, it just, I just seemed to have people that wanted to push me. Because I, I don't know if I was secure enough in myself at the time to take those steps. The fact of the matter is, you, you went from that, you made decisions based on, on necessity, and then the love of what you were doing. And as you say, that encouragement is amazing. We don't have to give yeah. that to enough people <laughs> enough of the time. Yeah, you just don't give up. And, and it's like with digital now, it's sometimes when I look at, I see some marvelous work from, uh, you know, directors of photography that I, I haven't heard of. And I know it's digital, and, and I go, Jesus Christ. And I think probably a lot of them come out of film school. My film school was on, on the job. And it worked, it worked for me, but I see stuff now that is just magnificent, you know. And uh, I mean, I did a little digital before I retired, but uh, nothing to speak of. It w I wouldn't have a problem with it at all. If somebody asked me what I, and I taught a class at the University of Notre Dame, they asked me to go to their film school and teach a class a couple couple years. Uh, it was a, two years in a row, I think. And and they asked, and it was digital, and you'd lit scenes, and, and then you would explain why you did it. And, and they said, well, how do you approach digital? I said, I approach lighting this like I approached film. I lit it. I lit it. I said, I, I, you know, uh, I see, I also see things where they don't light much and I wonder why, you know, uh, I don't, I don't have an answer for that. I'm not judgmental about it. I said, well, maybe they didn't have the equipment or, or whatever. But then when I see these shows like on Netflix or Hulu or, and some of these shows are gorgeous, but you can see they light it like it was film yes you may not you may not need as much light i suppose it's a fear i know a lot of uh, dops and their fear was losing their bit of work that all they were doing was composition and pointing the camera because the plan that has always been in the background to bring all your cinematography into the post-production phase right right but you got to give them the image don't you? yeah exactly that's, that's just this <laughs> yeah if it's not <laughs> Not, it's not there you know that's that's kind of my point is uh, uh, is and, and you know I, I I know uh on some shows you know especially on the television shows sometimes a producer would come down would be behind her and, and I you know I was I always tried to do it to the you know so when I went home at night I felt like well I did the best I can and they would sometimes they would say we can fix that in post. You don't need to keep lighting. And I, and that was the wrong thing to say. That, I know you, that exactly get, what you mean. <laughs> that would that would get my Italian side up. And I just, I just, <laughs> and then I just, I'd keep lighting. I, I tell a producer, go over and get another piece of pizza. So, so as a, an assistant, you were exposed, to, 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 excuse the pun, to a lot of great cinematographers that people don't even know because their work was in television. And like some of the black and white, I love, one of my favorite shows of the 60s is uh, Alfred Hitchcock. And some of the, the, everyone started talking about, oh, it's the great the way suddenly cinema came to uh, television in, in the 90s. I said, what are you talking about? Cinema was in, in television in, in the 60s, if you looked at the right programs. And the lighting mm -hmm. in those Hitchcock episodes is absolutely beautiful. Rob, you remember the name Robert Burks? He shot for Hitchcock a lot. A lot. I, I, I'm sure he won an Academy Award somewhere. But guys like that, lighting that old black and white, and, uh, that was another uh, a, a good thing when you worked as a loader and 
some of those old time guys like, uh, well, Conrad Hall was not an old time guy in those days, but he, he did uh, a, a little movie called Harper at Warner's. It was a smaller budget movie. I just watched it a few weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. And then he went on to, you know, Cool Hand Luke and all that. And Charles Lang was another guy. It was one of my favorites. And, uh, but watching Conrad light a scene, which I had no idea what he was doing, but then seeing like the movie Harper, then seeing Cool Hand Luke in that, and then he went on, as you know, you know his career, I'm sure. He was just kind of a guy that you wanted to kind of be, and he was a real nice, he was a real gentleman. You wanted to be like him, but his lighting, there was something that I would see in it, I'd say, you know, I know he lit that, but it doesn't look lit. He was an artist. And uh, yeah, you're right about the old timers. I, I'd go down and they'd be lighting black and white and they had to light. They had to use different, but you know, the depth and uh, they would put in these frames was, you know, it was an inspiration to try to learn that. You know, it was an inspiration to try to learn that. Who would have been a great mentor for you personally? A man named Howard Schwartz. I worked with him as an assistant. He, he was an old time black and white guy and he did a lot of television. And, and I worked with him as an assistant. He was the one that, um, and he was a great lighter. He, he was the one that told me when I went to work with him as an assistant cameraman, first assistant, if you stay with me for three years and pay attention, I'll make you a camera operator. And uh, he, he had worked with Orson Welles and all those guys as an operator. And I think one of the fi big pictures he worked on was, what was it, the Ambersons? Magnificent Ambersons, yeah. He was a real artist in his right. And, you know, he, would, he was a real giving teacher. When he, was, he would experiment with flashing film and things like that, and he would take me with him to learn that, to see what it does. And he would make me go to the dailies and see it. So I'd have to say Howard Schwartz, uh, he won I don't know how many Emmys, uh, was a great teacher, a guy named Ed Brown Senior. What, he came from New York and we did a, a mini series he didn't have an operator out here and I got recommended, well, actually I got recommended to him by Howard Schwartz uh, to do this mini series, Blind Ambition. Howard would set the shots up. You would be the operator. He would do, you would block it with the director and set them up. And that was kind of the way most of them did it. But when Eddie Brown came from New York, he, got, he called me aside and he said, now this is how I work. I'm a lighting cameraman. I like to work. The, I like to work the European style. I want the camera operator to work with the director and set the shots. And I thought, oh shit! Um, now I got to work with the director and set shots. I just want to keep them in the frame. Uh, but being talk about being a mentor. I did that. I learned to do it. I learned to communicate with directors and I kind of knew what they want. I did it with him for years too. And how that, how that worked later on in my career was when I be, became a director of photography, the experience I had from the discipline I got from Howard Schwartz, the discipline I got from Ed Brown senior, taught me a lot. So when I became a director of photography, if, if I got in trouble, if a director set up something that was almost impossible to light, especially if you're doing television, man, they're pushing you the whole time. Yeah. And I had no idea how to get it because I had that experience that Ed Brown taught me to learn about working with the director and setting up shots. It saved me a, numerous times not all the time sometimes they insisted on doing it uh, uh the way they wanted it but it would it would save me because i had experience operating i had experience working with a director and setting up shots so i could give him i could give a, a man it was mostly men in those days not as many women once in a while you'd run into a woman director but uh i could give him options i say well that will take me 
two and a half hours to light if you want to do a 360. Can I show you something with the camera? And so uh, I, he said, sure. you know, they were usually, uh, you know, cooperative on that. Um, I said, if, if, if we cut this down and you tell me if you like it to a, like 180 degrees, will it give you enough in the editing room to make a cut there? And it might cut out an hour and a half of lighting. So the, the, uh, that experience of having to work with directors setting up shots helped me down the road so many different times. Because a lot of times people have, and you know, the director is the boss on the set. He's the boss. You got, you got to remember that whatever he wants, uh, you should try to give him. But like John Seal has said, uh, we're there to service. What, how, what does he call him? Huh? Uh, the governor. <laughs> and the governor's the director. Were directors <laughs> mixed in their their skills technically or their knowledge of the technical side? Did you get some crazy kind of things to do because someone was just ignorant of what you were capable of or physically capable of? Or did you find generally directors were very good? Experienced directors understood more of what you were trying to do. You know, um, if, if you gave them an option, they would say, you know, okay, I understand. No, that would work for me. Sometimes the uh, directors would come in and uh, really had no idea how much more work there was if we did what you're asking. They didn't have the experience. Uh, I mean, you had to be, you know, you had to be very careful with the director when you made suggestions like that but you had to be honest. I always learned to be honest. Say, look, you, what you're laying out is going to take this long. Where are we in the day? How much uh, uh, will we be able to make this time up? Because it's going to take me two and a half hours to light that. Uh, and if they had experience, they, they would say, I understand. Show, show me what you mean. And let, let me see if it works for me. Sometimes they would come in and say, no, this is what I want. And so I said, Okay, we'll do that 360, but you see, I'm on a practical set here. I don't have, where am I gonna put lights? Now I gotta start building. Now I gotta start building rigs, but if that's you, what you want, I know how to do it, but it'll take you time. So yeah, you'd run into it once in a while, uh, but in general, um, experienced directors, and not always, you know, I had inexperienced directors I worked with that would come in and say, I know how to work with actors. I come from the stage. I've had that said to me. I know how to work with actors. I have no idea how to set up a shot. I'd say, hey, the, the gentleman turned out to be a terrific director. Uh, and he always gives me credit for that because he came up to me and said, uh, I don't know how to set a shot up. Will you help me? And he said, you said back to me, sit down i'll do my best and and uh you so you you know you got both yeah sometimes they'd be a little stubborn and and sometimes i could be stubborn too you know sometimes i'd get i would get that uh shit i don't know what i'm doing here uh, this guy's asking for the impossible but you know what when you have good crews you have good people under you a good gaffer, a good grip, a good operator, a good assistant. You get it figured out together. I, I didn't do it alone. Believe me, I didn't do it alone. You know, and then, of course, as you, as you just mentioned, you have actors in the mix. <laughs> and they're trying to get on with their jobs, too. <laughs> thank you for reminding me of that. Because, because when a director would say, let's line this up with the stand-ins. I said, line it up with the stand-ins. I said, what about when the actors come in and we got a bunch of marks and I've lit for two hours and the actors would say, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I wouldn't go there. Now you got to understand something. I'm going to, I'm going to mark, I'm going to mark it so I can light it, <laughs> you know, but, and I had that happen to me. I, I mean, I had it, they, well, no, I, we don't have time to bring the actors in. I'll rehearse them in the dressing room. This is what I want. They're going to go here, put a mark here and that. And I've had it. I said, this is kind of dangerous. It's going to backfire on us. 
and actors would come in and they see all these marks and they go, I wouldn't go there, you, you know? <laughs> uh, so then you got to start all over again. I say, well, okay, go back and rehearse them some more because this is what they want to do. And uh, it'd take another whatever it took. But uh, another guy I learned a lot from uh, as an op operator from was a guy named Owen Roisman. French Connection. Um, wow, Mr. Verite. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, exorcist, you know, it go, goes on and on. But I, I got a, I went in and operated a B camera for him. He was from New York too. A guy, the A operator, brought me in, and uh, he was trying out different guys. He didn't know anybody from L.A. And it was a picture called Straight Time with uh, Dustin Hoffman. And, it's a good movie. Yeah, it is. And uh, I, I went in and operated B camera for him, and. Uh, he took a liking to me, you know, uh, he was very, he asked me this later on and he said, was I a jerk? I said, no, no, you were very demanding about composition, but you weren't a jerk. And he was, it was the right sidelines here, the left sidelines here, the headroom is here. This is what I want when I'm looking at the monitor. That's what you got to get. So, and that, you know, that was demanding, but, especially if actors were off marks and things like that. But I learned, I learned a lot from him too, you know, um, a great lighter. And I, I would see things he would lit and I'd go, God darn, he doesn't have enough light on that. And uh, I go see dailies and I go, boy, I got a lot to learn, you know? Yeah. It's a process. The whole, the whole thing is a process. Uh, but they were teachers, you know, yeah, Owen was uh, very demand. They were all demanding in their own way. DOPs were always looking for really solid camera ops. And, and what do you think that magic thing is that you yourself are looking for? Well, what I look for in a camera operator is what was expected of me. You know, um, DPs would say, okay, this is the shot. Now, if you have a suggestion, if you see something, if you see likewise, if you see something that doesn't look right to you, I want you to speak up because you are my eyes, you know? And, uh, and so I kind of, when I first moved up, um, the operator I had was a friend of mine who had moved up a couple of years before, but he was a natural operator and had a great eye. So, um, you know, I was nervous in lighting. Like I said, when I first moved up, I knew what I wanted. I kind of knew what I wanted to get, and I didn't. Uh, I didn't really know how to get it, but I knew it when I saw it. So uh, the operator, all what was expected of me, uh, is to look out for them, too. I mean, composition and everything. They show you composition and things, but I learned that, and and I had a knack with the wheels for some reason. You know. I, I, I was just pretty good at it, but I mean, I had a lot to learn about composition and things, but that's what I wanted. I wanted somebody to, to, to be able to be smooth in their operation, not call attention to uh, what you're doing because you're trying to tell a story. But also if I screw something up, I hope you notice it. You know, if, uh, if an actor is in the dark or, or I mean, in the background where I wanted an effect or something. I want you to see the whole picture because that's what was taught to me. That was taught to me. And know. it's a good thing I, to I remember mean, that cameras back then were a tough operation compared to some of the, the technology today. And even the freedom, even the freedom that cameras have today is so, is so different. Yeah, yeah. And, and when I first moved up, uh, they had the, uh, the Panaflex with the rotating eyepiece hadn't come out yet. And uh, the first show I, I operated on was, a, uh, was an anthology series called uh, Love Story. And Michael Landon was the director and he was very, I mean, great guy, but he was very creative with his camera moves. And the eyepiece did not rotate or move up or down. So if he, st if he started and he did, and Howard Schwartz was the director of photography and he had moved me up on that. 
if he started on the ground, you had to figure out how to get your body in a position and keep your eye on that camera and come up around 180 degrees, co composing a picture and walking a dolly. Because the eyepiece did not move. And it was hard, but it was great training. Some takes, it took me a long time to get it right. And they were very patient with me. But then when the Panaflex came in and the eyepiece went up and down, it made the operating a little simpler. I mean, I'm not saying it wasn't impossible at times, some of the shots they lay out, but the experience of being it in, when I got in, the old BNC cameras, uh, the, not the rotating eyepiece, you had to learn your craft. And the video assist wasn't what it is today either. No, and they depended on your eye. You know, you know uh, they depended on your eye. You're seeing it. You know, I know they used to say that. Now you're seeing it. If something goes wrong, after we cut, let's talk. When do you think, Mike, that the your creative muscle started to start p bounce away there, and you suddenly felt like a craftsman in a different way than you were when you started as a loader? When you got, you started getting really creative. Did, did Howard, with Howard Schwartz, the man who, who got the fire in the belly, as it were? He got the fire in the belly of me to learn the craft that I was learning at the time. He, he made me, Howard, Howard was very responsible in making me the kind of operator I was at the beginning, because I was, he was the beginning of me operating. And uh, like I said, he was demanding, but he was fair. And when I would, you know, like they didn't have the uh, video assistant in those days, when we go to dailies, uh, if I had a little too much headroom or I didn't frame it over enough to make, uh, you know, tell the story in a pleasing picture, he would tell me. So I learned, learned that from a lot from him. And then, um, and then watching films, you know, uh, but then the Eddie make it, helping me learn how to set shots up with directors, uh, uh, and then when I got the break to go with Nick McLean, I got to give Nick McLean uh, people that push me. There's a couple of people that push me uh, that said I should be a DP when I was an operator. And like I said, I never felt that I, I had that artistic. And that's the question you asked. Uh, until uh, guys like uh, Nick, uh, I'm going to say Nick because uh, I don't recall, would go have me go out and shoot second unit or, or pre-light a set that he's going to shoot in a couple of days or something. He'd say, go down there. Uh, uh, they want to I, I want to see what this looks like, Mike. And uh, it scared me. You know, I thought, well, God, I got to match his work. And his work was always so good, I thought. Uh, but I would go out and do it. I, they would give me an electrician and, you know, it wouldn't be no hurry or anything, but I'd go out and do it. And then uh, the next day we'd go to dailies and, uh, and this is how I got another break. It was because of Nick. Um, Mel Brooks was the director and I would do these, like these sets that I, you know what? I think that kind of changed that. Well, maybe I do understand this process and I do have a little, artistic thing because I'd go to dailies the next day and it looked pretty good and of course I was nervous about it and Mel Brooks would say to Nick Nick that looks beautiful when we get to that set let's do it like that but Nick McLean Nick McLean didn't take the credit Nick McLean said thank Mike he went out and pre let that that was space balls yes so I have to, uh, I think Nick McLean was the one who gave me that, that in that, I mean, there's probably others, but uh, I think he gave me that incentive. Well, maybe I could do this. And by that, by that is how I got uh, after Spaceballs, uh, you know, I was still operating for Nick. I don't remember how many pictures in between by doing that. And by Nick saying, Hey, don't thank me. Thank Mike. I got a, a movie with Mel Brooks at 20th Century Fox. It was uh, Robin Hood, Men in Tights. 
because Mel Brooks would say to me on the set, just out of the blue, he was, he was great. He'd look at me and say, you should be a DP. I said, oh, I don't want to be a DP. I, I just want to steer this camera and make you happy. I didn't want to tell him I was scared to death to do it. But, but from that, from, and that all came from Nick. Nick, 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 I can't thank Nick enough for my career. When I started operating, I did a lot of television before I went to work with Nick. I did a movie with Owen, a couple movies with Owen, and I would get B cameras and that. But Nick took a chance on me. Uh, when he needed a camera operator for uh, Cannonball 2, there was a down period in my life where I was, a, you know, uh, I was a partier. But what, when Nick heard I was changing, I tried to change my life. And he said, he, he told me this after about the second picture. He says, you don't, you probably don't know how you got this break. I said, no, I don't, but I'm, I'm very grateful for it. He says, well, I asked um, a million people, I mean, he was exaggerated, what kind of guy you were. And he said, I knew you could operate a camera. He said, but I asked people what kind of guy you are. And they said, well, he's a good guy, but he's a little wild, you know. He might show up a little late, uh, might be a little hungover, uh, but he'll get the job done. He didn't want to take a chance then, and I, I get that, I get that. But then he heard I got clean and sober, and he gave me that chance. He says, I heard you, uh, you know, I always knew you could operate, Mike but I couldn't take that chance. Because when he called me to come out on Cannonball Run, I thought it would be a B or C camera. I said, yeah, I think I'll be a, what is it, B camera, C camera? He says, no, I want you to be the man. I said, what do you mean? He says, you're the A camera operator. Jesus Christ. Yeah, but he judged you well, Mike. He knew you were gonna step up to the plate. Yeah, he did. He saw, he probably saw in me what I never, I didn't see up to that. And I was doing okay. I mean, I was working, you know, I was, I was working, but I think I had more of a reputation as being a TV operator. And, uh, uh, and even though I had done a few pictures, uh, but it was mainly extra camera, but, but I could operate a camera. And Nick was one of the best operators of all time, you know, and uh, that break, once I went to work with Nick McLean, this is the honest to God truth, and I'd been an operator for, I operated totally for 17 years. I'd been an operator for a long time at that time. You, I would get calls from Bill Frakers, different D, big DPs. All of a sudden, they knew who I was. So did you feel that television, you were in a bit of a rut by just being in television at that point and that? Once that break happened with Cannonball Run, it fed was different energy to your work. Television to me was a great uh, learning ground. It was a great learning ground. And in those days, you know, television and like you say, features were separated. But when I got into doing features all the time, and people would say, how'd you get that on the first take? You mean you got that on the first take? I'd go, yeah. I didn't know what they were talking about. Because <laughs> you just were primed by all your TV training. It was, it was a, a crane shot with a 20 millimeter lens panning the, uh, the turret around 180 degrees. I, well, I used to do that all day long. You know? So it was that experience from television that, that I think helped me a lot. And, and in fact, on Cannonball Run, a guy said that to me. He said, how can you get this stuff on first take? I said, well, I, I, you know, I learned that in television. <laughs> Nick knew who he was choosing for the job. So, I mean, Cannonball Run is lots of action. It's yeah, tons, yeah. tons of action. Yeah, and then going in knowing that Nick McLean was one of the best operators of all time, and go, oh, my God, am I going to live up to this guy? He was never like that. He, uh, he, he would tell me what he wanted, and he'd let me go find it. I mean, he, if he had specific things... He would get on the camera and set it up, but a lot of times he gave me that freedom, and uh, he it, he just made my life so easy, and and changed my life, you know. And uh, she went on to shoot Stick. I think was one that you were camera up on, weren't you? I was. A, that was the next picture with Nick. It was a. It was a complex little shoot as well. Yeah, yeah, 
But, you know, we had time, uh, uh, you know, Nick and Bert knew, well, Bert made Nick a, a director of photography. You know that, I know that. But uh, so their, their rapport as a director of cameraman was, you know, a, a gift from God. Uh, they worked so well together. And the communication was so well between them to what my responsibilities were. And the shots, yeah, there were some, I think, diff I can't call, recall them now, but I, like I said, the experience that I had with Nick and Bert made my life easy yeah. as a camera operator. I knew, because I knew the communication. I knew what they told me what they wanted. You know, they told me, so I, it was never, oh, it, is this what he wants or uh, what does Bert mean? It, the communication was so good uh that it was really it wasn't a hard job for me it was it was a uh, uh, stick was a was a lot of fun we were in uh fort lauderdale florida for three months uh uh with bert uh, you never had to pay for anything you know uh we worked five days a week on location which was unheard of in the old days uh you know and it was just it, it was real gratifying for me uh uh, with Bert, you know, I, I loved Bert Reynolds. He was he was a man's man. He was my kind of guy. And then you put Nick McLean on top of that, and it's uh, it was. You know what? I don't remember a difficult time with those guys. Your transition to DOP yourself, where you're kind of in charge, was that a different kettle of fish? Was that you, you must have had a lot of nerves when you stepped onto this set of Robin Hood. Well, that wasn't my first. That hasn't. That isn't how I got moved up into a, a DP. I was actually I was working for uh, Bob Stevens. Uh, Robert Stevens moved up on his first movie. Uh, it was Naked Gun, and he and I had been working with Nick. I'd done two or three pictures by that time, and Robert I knew as an assistant and an operator in that. And uh, he called me to operate his first movie, which was Naked Gun. And I and I did Naked Gun, and he would do the same thing with me. He'd uh, he'd say, "Go out and uh, 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 I want you to shoot the second unit." Oh, it's coming back to me now. So uh, uh, I, I would, you know, I would go out and I would light second units, whether it was day or night, and you know they'd see it and they'd like it. But I got that. But uh, this is how I got moved up. When he was down, I went to work with Lloyd Ahern. Well, Lloyd, who's an old friend of mine. He, he pushed me with, with the Botchko producers. He says, you know, this guy should be a DP. Because Lloyd would say, when are you going to move up? I know you've gone out and you've done some commercials and things like that. But he said, when are you going to move up? I said, no, nah, I don't want to move up, Lloyd. Uh, I said, it, it, I don't want all the politics. And it, was, it, was, uh, it was a fear-based excuse. But he kept pushing me with the Botchko people. So I, I don't remember the time frame. They were doing a series called Doogie Hauser. Now I wasn't on it. And the cap, they were ha the camera operator. They were going to replace the camera operator. Well, some of the producers that were on Hooperman were on uh, uh, that were going to do Doogie Hauser rem remembered me from the Hooperman days, and Lloyd pushed me with them. Well, bring Mike O'Shea in. So I went in uh, on Doogie Hauser and took over as the operator. And the DP only wanted to do the first season. And I, I you know, I just made good uh, uh, contacts with the producers that were running that show. When he left, uh, they said, uh, who are we going to get to replace you? He said, well, how about my operator? That was Frederick Moore. And, uh, and they took a chance on me. And I was scared. And like I said, but I was fortunate because I inherited his crew. The crew wanted to stay. Was that Doogie Hauser already a season in when you took over? Started, done about two or three episodes, I think, is when they wanted to make the change. And that's when I took over. And uh, it, it just worked out to where um, he, let, he wanted to leave. He wanted to move on. One season was enough. And they took a chance on me. And... Uh, I got to inherit his crew who were really experienced. And I was very honest with him. I said, you know, I know what I want to do, 
but I don't know. I said, I don't know what that lamp's called. You know, give me a, give me an inky dinky. I said, I don't even know what the hell that is. And what were the challenges for a show like that? I mean, it's about a, a whiz kid doctor, but it's a hospital drama, uh, essentially. Did you find that a hospital drama kind of, they can be a bit tough to keep interested in all that sterile environment? You know what I try to do? Because the, the set was designed with the fluorescence above. And so when they would do the long walk and talks down the hallways, I, I didn't want to use just top light. Okay, said, yeah. You, you know what I mean? That just makes people look hollow. It's, it works. Uh, uh, but to me, if I was going to learn how to light, I had to find other places to uh, assimilate maybe light coming from another room. So any doorway I had, they could walk in and out of something. It was a big show, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. It was a big hit. It was a real big hit. Yeah. Um, it went, I think I did it four seasons. And that's, and that's after Spaceballs, and Mel Brooks was on Fox. It was done at 20th Century Fox. And his offices were at uh, uh, Fox. And I would see him at lunch or something at the cafeteria or something. He'd say, you son of a bitch, I'm going to make you a DP someday. That was all from Spaceballs, that, the, the, the uh, connection I got because of Nick. And when he finally talked the studio into using the television camera to shoot uh, – Robin Hood men in tights, because uh, they wanted him. He told me this. He said, they want me to use $20,000 a week camera. Well, they weren't going to pay me that. And uh, he said, but I took a I'm taking a chance on you. You son of a bitch. You better be fast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nick told me a great story. He said, Mel, Mel Brooks said to him, he said, look, he said, Nick, I pay for that set. I want to see every bit of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know what my dialogue with him, with him was when we would, because uh, he did build some nice sets. And I'd say, now, if I light everything, I'll make, because the, the most important thing to him was that you see the actors' faces. I said, but look at the castle sets here. This was on Robin Hood. I said, don't you want to build some depth in that? Don't you want to really, really feel those, you know, those walls? And if you just light everything broadly, and Nick didn't do it on Spaceball. He, uh, he, he, lit, he lit the way you should light. And, uh, and, and all Mel would say to me is, I don't have all day. Make sure what you're talking about, go fast. But he gave me the freedom to try to be creative. He made a black and white film, which was unheard of at the time. A black and white comedy when there was color available. I'm not sure Woody Allen, you know, you, you didn't go down that road. And, and obviously there was, that was a big creative choice that he, so he kind of got, I think he got stuck with, I think it was Gene Wilder really that pushed that. I'd say if Mel had his way, it might've been in color. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, it, and, and like you saw some of the other films, uh, you know, they, it wasn't that the lighting was bad, but it was too br everything was lit yeah blazing Mostly, saddles is, everything is lit everything is lit and I, it's not a criticism but if if the production design is so important and when they're when they're building these 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 great sets to over light them doesn't give credit to the set or the production designer or so, uh, you know, the, the, the experience I got from the different people I worked with was give them what they want, but always have a, a, back, a back plan. And I'll, and I'll protect the actors, that's important. But make it, try to make it as real as possible. Okay, this came across a great quote from Gordon Willis. He said, a good film is, is an amalgamation of loads of things. It's not me just turning up as the cameraman with a, a lighting design. If, if the sets aren't there, if the performances aren't there, all that stuff isn't worth a damn. That's how I felt. You know, if, uh, why build them? Why build them and destroy them with the light? You know, if that makes sense. Uh, uh, and Mel was, Mel was good about it. The one thing he was very adamant about was um, seeing the actors' faces. 
So I had to compromise a little bit. If I wanted to use half light or something, or, you know, if it was a moodier scene, I just had to make sure that the actor's faces were pleasant. And then he let me do what I wanted with the sets. But I said, you're building these sets, you're spending a lot of money. Let me show you something. Let me, I'll, I'll do it fast, you know. And uh, that's just, um, you know, they say the most important light sometimes is the one you turn off. And he just wanted to tell the stories. And he was very appreciative uh, uh, when he would see it. I mean, the only problem, there wasn't a problem, was when we go to time the movie on film, I, he would give me my first pass or two, and uh, I always made it too dark for him. And he, when he came in to look at the pass that I'd made with the film, with the color timer, he'd say, it's too dark. We got to come up some. And, I, and, and we would, but he never sabotaged what we were trying to do. Just, you know, uh, so uh, you know, I had a lot to be grateful for him too. But, uh, and that film, that film uh, did pretty well, it didn't do real well, but it got me his next film, uh, Dracula. Yeah, dead and loving it. You, you got to work with Leslie Nielsen again. Oh, <laughs> that was a treat. He was a fantastic character. He was funny. He he was real funny, and he had the uh, you know the little hand thing you do to make farts. Yeah, I heard about that. He, 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 oh my God, he was he was that was all day long, you know, and he he could pull that off, and people would actually think he did it. And you go, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, I had maybe it was a lunch. I saw him in the mayor's office, Los Angeles mayor's office. We were shooting downtown LA in City Hall, and they they introduced him to the mayor. And I would just the camera was there, and he, you know, and he's talking to the mayor. Uh, Tom Bradley was his name at the time, and uh, and there's a lot of people around, and I know what's going to happen because he didn't care if it was he he wouldn't have cared if it was the Queen. He would have done it. He's talking to he's talking to the mayor and the whole crowd, of, and he lets this thing go and a lot of gas. And he goes, "Oh, excuse me, Mr. Mayor, I, I had a little fish for lunch." <laughs> so I, those those movies were fun. I had a lot of fun on those. You know, it was it was interesting that uh, Mel and Leslie Nielsen finally working together. They had they had a good rapport though. I mean, who's the king of comedy? Mel Brooks, the two of them had mutual respect for that. You know, I mean, if Leslie had an idea, Mel was open to the idea. And if Mel didn't, if Mel said, no, I want you to do this way, Leslie was open to it. Did you know, Mel so. want you to shoot as well in a way that would aid any improvisation? Was that part of his thinking? Well, we used two, two cameras a lot. We, yeah, you know, and where you had to be careful with that uh, is, if you're shooting the actress and you got the wide shot with the A camera and, and he'd want to do, you know, you're lighting for the wide shot. So if he wanted to get a close up of the actress, a, a, a man wasn't as hard, but a, a beautiful actress. And you know, you had to finesse the light. And we get a close up there of, of her and I'd say, well, the lighting won't be right on. Or if you could, you could find an angle that would be pleasing uh, to, to utilize the B camera. It was mainly just, it was two cameras, but most of it was really uh, old time filmmaking. It was one camera, then we go in for coverage. And then you'd relight for the close ups, you know. Uh, make, the, make the master as good as you can, uh, tell the story, then we'll cover it. And that method still works. Yeah. Well, to me, that's filmmaking. It gives you a chance to, you know, to kind of hone your craft. Do you think that a negative with digital film is how it allows uh, t t the, the principles of work are di a little bit different with some people? They don't seem to prepare the same way because of what they can get away with, with coverage and stuff like that. Whereas, uh, as you said, you worked with coverage. Film is expensive. You, you got it yeah. right. There was no mucking around and, ah, oh, we'll do it another 50 times. Right, and which they do. I think they do that. They do more of that now. And I think my son is in the business. He's an assistant cameraman. And uh, he said, the way they shoot now, Dad, uh, he said, I, I would take a bet that you would probably last about a half hour. I said, well, why do you say? 
why do you say that? And he says, because they, they like, he's doing a show called This Is Us. It's, it's a real popular show. It's a really good show, well-written and well-acted. But they take three cameras on every shot and shoot opposing angles and everything. I wouldn't know how to begin to like that and make it look good. And that's what he meant by it. He said, but that's the norm in this television. Multiple but this is where the post-production lighting comes into play. It could, have, it could have the lighting of the set and then some extra lighting put in afterwards using their software. I'm surprised they ha haven't got camera people in the scene on top of the actors wearing green suits and just rub them out afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I tell you, it's going to happen. <laughs> It's going to happen. That's scary because uh, what does that do to us? But I, I got to tell you something digital, like I said in the beginning, I saw a lot of that. But the, when I see a show that's lit digital, I can tell that they had a good director of photography, not only because of where the light is, his placement of camera. And of course, the director is very important in that too. I just watched a show called The Undoing. And, uh, it's digital, obviously. Every frame, almost every single frame, whether he lit or whatever uh, uh, second unit they had uh, establishing shots was well thought out. And when, when they were downtown at night shooting, establishing stuff, they always made sure there was pen different pools of light. And I thought, now that's the way to shoot it. And, 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 and the way they laid their shot outs. Now, I'm so into the story that obviously I'm kind of watching for that. But I'm into the story because the acting was Nicole Kidman. Is her, uh, she's in it. And Hugh Grant. It, it's a great uh, four-episode series. But that, that director of photography, uh, his name is Anthony Dodd Mantle. He did, a, he did a marvelous job. Creativity hasn't gone away. The tools are changing all the time, but creativity is still what drives them. Well, you know, uh, that's why I say I don't want to be judgmental when I see, of course, when I see something like that, I go, wow, uh, that's, that's great. That's the way to shoot a film. And then I'll see something and they go outside or they go inside and you can tell they're just trying to, uh, they're trying to use just the practical lighting uh, and, and it's too dark. You can't see anything. You you can't see the set or so. I don't know what the what the, um, the the conditions are if that's just the way they have to do it. But the way I was taught is tell the story, whether you're an assistant cameraman keeping it in focus, whether you're an operator co composing moves, composing pictures, or you're a DP lighting the set. Try to tell the story. You know, uh, obviously the producers and the director have a vision. Try to implement that, but tell the story in every frame. So now when I see that, I go, God, I wish I could see that story. Because the dialogue is good and the story is good, but they're not using any light. But then conversely, you see Anthony Dodd Mantle's work. Now, I know it was a bigger budgeted thing, but, uh, and they probably had a lot of time. I go, that's the way they could, I mean, even if you, sometimes I want to go like, couldn't you use one light somewhere? So I, uh, so I don't get that, but I don't know the circumstances. Any favorite projects, other projects that you've done besides what we've talked about that you hold hand to heart that you say was a great, it was a great creative achievement for you in collaboration? CSI Miami was, uh, 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 I did the first season of CSI Miami. Uh, that was very gratifying uh, because the, their, their concept of camera moves and lighting, they shot everything with long lenses. So, and they had good sets, but they liked to lay back with long lenses. Well, that's, to me, that was a dream. I could put the light, I could put the light wherever I wanted and tell the story. And so that, that was gratifying. I won an award for that show. Uh, I won an Emmy for that. So that, that was gratifying. The, the movies I did, I shot a little movie called Here on Earth. 
It was a director I had worked with in television, and uh, it was his first feature, and he took me along. And uh, uh, because of, because of uh, he trusted my camera moves laying out shots, it was the same kind of deal. I could, I could light it, and it was a drama. It didn't do real well, but that was very gratifying. Um, I don't know. There were so many things I did as an operator with Nick that were gratifying. Uh, when you worked on CSI Miami, I mean, you were setting out a template for the, the entire kind of rest of the series in a way. Did it kind of, did you find that, that the DOP can in sometimes be the, the strongest creative visual person on the set as opposed to the directors who come in and they're dealing with the actors, but the sensibility of the show's visuals are already kind of set in stone almost. When the show has been going, you mean? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah and the, but the creative, the, the creative producer on the show, who is also a director, um, he was very creative lighting-wise. Mm -hmm. And he, he is actually the one that set the camera movements with the long lenses. Because I know I, I interviewed for, uh, with him for the first CSI, the, the original, and I didn't, uh, I turned it down, they offered it to me, but when Miami came up, they offered that to me, and I thought, well, maybe I'll give that a shot. But uh, he was very creative. Um, so for me to go in there, he lets you light, uh, but the most important thing for him was the, well, I don't want to say the most important, uh, was the camera movement and the long lens. Now the lighting, they wanted, they, they challenged you to come up with something new all the time. Okay. for lighting and effects because there was a lot of effects in that and we, we'd have an effects unit and you you know and that would be an extra unit but that that would you know when I went in there I went in there with a, a feeling these people are going to push me because these are these are uh, successful shows and I had watched the original CSI and it was done great the DPs were great and I loved the camera movement. And so when I got Miami, it would be a different, it would be a warmer look. I, I knew what they were going for. So we said, there was two of us. We alternated cameramen, Walt Lloyd and myself. So we set the look on Miami. But that was mainly, we didn't change camera movement, uh, but we changed the, uh, the concept of the color schemes, you know? And uh, so I have to give credit to him too because uh, he was he he was a good he is a good DP and uh, but but it was uh, it was a challenge because they, they you know they they would throw things at you. Uh, Bones is another one that you were fairly strongly involved in, and it's a very different show, but uh, another kind of it has a forensic kind of team. Was the big set that was supposed to be the interior of the lab. You know, they had a big uh, a psych up above the ceiling. It was an open ceiling and they wanted to make sure they liked wide angle lenses and shoot up and, and see this huge set and make sure that that looks like daylight out there. That was a challenge because it, it, it's a blue psych. So you can blow as much light in it as you want. To me, it, to me, it always looked like a blue psych. The set was good. Uh, depending again on what the director wanted, it was so big. And if they wanted to do 360s with the Steadicam, Steadicam, I, I, it has a purpose. But, you know, when you get on the Steadicam and they want to start doing 180s and 360s, you get no place to light it, even though you have a big set. That's where you have to learn from your experience to say, that's going to take a long time because now I got to hang more lights. And even though you've pre-rigged a lot of stuff, some of the shots were impossible. And uh, fortunately, we had a lot of good directors that understood, but it was just making that set look, you know, come alive, you know? And it was just, again, to me, yeah, it was hard to make that blue psych look. I, I blew it out, but to me, in my mind, I said, ah, this looks like a set, but they never complained about it. But it was, it was working, was trying to make the set, even though it was big and beautifully built, to give it the depth. Because if you shot it flat, it would be flat. It would just be a big set. So, I mean, it was, it, it was, it was a challenge. I did the first season and that was enough. But. Were you ever tempted to direct? But I had the opportunity. People say, people had the, the wrong conception, I think, of cameramen. When cameramen, well, 
they would say to me like, you should be a director. I'd say, no, I'm not a director. I'm a director of photography. I'm directing the, the, the photography, so, so to speak. But I said, a director is the one that's working and communicating how they see this script. I don't know that I have that ability. But now the more I, I, I know Nick took that chance and he did a good job. I was just scared of the communication part. How my, my concept, how am I gonna relate that to an actor? I, I just had a lot of fear about that and I never did it. I wish I would have, I wish I would have because I was scared to death to do this. I think, well, what do I got to say? You know, uh, that's just, you know, whatever it is, it's okay. Uh, but I wish I would have because I get so involved in story you now, now you know. I I get so involved watching when actors, uh, when the actors pull it off and it's so real. I have something to relate, to, especially if I'm relating to them. I'll say to myself, you know what? You would have related to that if you would have taken the chance. Do you miss it now that you're retired? Do you kind of ever get the the feeling you'd love to do something? I do miss it. I uh, I feel even though I'm getting older. Uh, I still have the energy to do it. Uh, I miss the art of it. I miss the camaraderie of, of, of the DPs I worked with, the, cr the crews I work with. I miss that probably uh, as much as anything. But, I, but when I, wa I watch a lot of uh, TV, mainly uh, Netflix, and I don't watch a lot of network TV anymore, but and I see things, how they could be done and how, what opportunities I would have with the experience I have. I, I miss it. I'd like to have that chance again. But I've been, at, I've been out of it so long, they probably say, first of all, this guy's too old. And, uh, but I don't feel that way because I still love, I love to go to art films. I love to see little art films where they don't have a lot of money, but they got, act, they got top actors. And, and DPs that I've never heard of, I go, Jesus, this budget couldn't have been that big. And look at how that looked. Yeah. Or look at, look at that performance. So I miss that challenge. Uh, I miss it a lot. And I miss seeing my, my, my crews. And I miss seeing Nick a lot every day, you know, working with him. all. I'm, I just miss people. So yeah. I, I don't think it'll ever be out of my blood. And the more, the more Netflix and the more Hulu and the more Prime I watch, the more I'll miss, the more I'll miss it, you know. I mean, I was blessed. I got, you know, I was given opportunities, and I had good teachers, and I was smart enough that I always had a good gaffer and a good grip, because I could say to them, "This is what I have in mind. What do you think?" And they could say, "Watch, you know, watch. We'll get it for you." And uh, so I learned from that. You know, and they would say, you got a real good eye. I said, but I don't know what that lamp's called. They say, you don't have to know. That's why they hire me. The gaffer would say that. Just tell me you want a light coming from there. I'll figure. And, I, and I eventually I learned it. But uh, I have to, I just have to say I had a blessed career. I got the ASC uh, Lifetime Achievement in Television Award. And that was very gratifying. That, that was a moment. My mother got to see, my father had already passed away. but. It was, you know, the, the ASC awards are a big deal. And I, I remember when they called me and said, uh, we want to give you the uh, Career Achievement in Television Award. And I said, I think you dialed the wrong number. And they said, no, this was voted on by your peers. And, and then when I went to the, uh, a dinner before and I saw who the other honorees were, John Seal and Roger Deakins. And I saw my name with those guys. Uh, I, I can only give thanks to people that taught me. People that gave me the opportunity. Good company. Yeah, I said, God darn. I think I said it to my wife. I said, Sharon, my name is on this thing with John Seal and Roger Deakins. They're giving, I think John Seal got the International Award and John, yeah, John Seal got the International Award for Cinematography, and Roger got, he might have got Lifetime Achievement at that time. And I thought, my name is on here. And she said, well, you must have earned it, Mike. 
And I got to, you know, I got to invite my family. It's like 1,600 people. It's like the Academy Awards for us. And I got to have my, my mother there, my 97-year-old mother, and uh, my, my brother, my sister, my, my kids, my grandkids, my crew. So I was, I, I wouldn't have got there if I hadn't been who I'd been with in my career. Uh, I was taught uh, sometimes uh, harshly and sometimes lovingly, but I was taught. Uh, if, I, if anybody asked me what I would do now, I'd say I'd do nothing different. It's just a different format, but I would do nothing different. I'd, I'd always, always try to tell the story. I'd always try to make the light right where it's supposed to be. And when I'm, what I would do different now, I wouldn't be so stubborn, Paul. Mike, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Paul. This has been a pleasure.